All right, ready? All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for being here today. We are, um, boy, I tell you, what a fantastic weather we've had this summer. I've been working on getting everybody to wear their Hawaiian print shirts throughout the summer, and many of you have reciprocated. Really appreciate that. Thank you all for being here. Aloha, Steve. Gary Parker was wearing his yesterday. Steve was wearing his yesterday. And um, so what this, you know, we got the Thai Cup uh, soccer tournament happening this weekend in town. There's going to be about 35 teams wandering around Gig Harbor for the next three days and starting tomorrow. So you'll see these kids at the fast food restaurants and uptown in their soccer uniforms and their flip flops with their long socks on and stuff like that. It's really a fun event. But anyway, welcome today. Our special guest today is Lisa Christensen. She is going to be talking about the Norway and Gig Harbor Sisters Cities Initiative. Uh, Lisa was born and raised in Anchorage, Alaska and lives in Gig Harbor. She is the Norwegian Honorary Council for Alaska and the founder and CEO of Alaska Blue Energy Consulting, a company focused on analyzing business strategies of alternative energy companies seeking entry into the Alaskan energy market. She is also the CEO of Community Service Fund Raising Alliance a multi-million dollar company that supports three large charities. She started her career as a CPA with Deloitte in Seattle. Uh, and before transferring to Deloitte, Switzerland and Zurich, she then helped establish a financial analysis group for hydro energy in Oslo, Norway. Upon returning to the United States, Lisa was the president and CEO of Alaska World Affairs Council from 2007 to 2023. During these 16 years, she implemented high impact programs with over 550 world leaders. She was Named Anchorage's top 40 under 40, inducted into the Anchorage Chamber of Commerce Athena Society and earned national recognition from the National World Affairs Council of America, being named leader of the year out of the 94 council leaders around the United States. She is a national public speaker. She was appointed to the honorary commander uh, as the honorary commander of the F-22 fighter squadron at Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson. She has a passion for sports, including pickleball. She understands she was playing for several hours last season in the Homestead Park, <laughs> including she plays the piano and has participated in six Ironman triathlons, including the Ironman World Championship in Kona, Hawaii. Thank you, Lisa, for being here. We really appreciate that. In fact, you're chosen to live in our, commu in our community. Come on up here. Thank you, thank you, thank you Kurt. It is such a pleasure to be here. I just love coming to the chamber. I don't know, did anyone come when I spoke a little bit last year about the initiative? Okay, good. So this is gonna be a little bit, oh yeah, that's right, via Zoom. This is the first time in person. So this is actually really good to actually talk with people and drink tea and you know commune. So this is, this is super, super. And you're the only person who actually pronounces my name correctly. So it is Lisa with an E. That's how you say Lisa in Norway. E's are pronounced at the end of words. So Lisa and Christiansen is my last name. We say Christiansen. So um, a little about, about me. I, um, like Kurt said, I moved to Gig Harbor about two years ago. Followed a guy, big mistake, stayed to in Gig Harbor. Best idea ever. Love Gig Harbor. And um, you'll find me around town. This is kind of me professionally and personally a little bit. So um, in Norway, this says the, the Royal um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs with some of my colleagues, or you'll see me in Alaska in my Norwegian costume speaking about all things Norwegian. Um, here's the Norwegian ambassador. Now, it's the first female ambassador to the United States. To the United States. Her name is Anakin Krutnes. And there she is at the Nordic History Museum up in Ballard. Uh, my son here, who is also in uh, Gig Harbor with me, and my other one who is in Norway, uh, he, he was born in Norway, he grew up in Alaska, but then they both went to school a little bit in Norway, and he hasn't come back yet. So he is a music producer, and he plays in a bunch of bands, living the life, traveling all around Norway, just loving it. And as Kurt said, it was National Pickleball Day. And I kind of have appointed myself also, I should put that on my little CV, as the International Ambassador for Pickleball Diplomacy. It should be a thing, and I'd like to start it. And this is the ambassador who I introduced to pickleball in February. So she has now been to Gig Harbor three times. Um, because of the Sister City Initiative, I keep on inviting her to come. And she comes, and so I said, come for a weekend in February, and let's play pickleball. 
And I said, you know, you have to learn pickleball. If you're in Washington, it's a state sport. And so she did. And she came back again a few weeks ago. This is her just a couple of weeks ago here in Gig Harbor at Simmel Park playing pickleball again. You'll find me on the water a lot. Um, as Kurt said, I live in downtown Gig Harbor in St. John's Old Episcopal Church and just absolutely love it. So here's some, here's some pictures of the ambassador as she's been here. Um, and, and I like bringing her here because of the sister city initiative that we have established. Every time that she comes here, she falls in love with Gig Harbor just a little bit more. And then she talks about it when she goes back to Norway. She bumps into the mayor of our sister city, Bulda, at different conventions and conferences, and she encourages her to come. And that has resulted in the mayor agreeing to come here a Bulda in the fall. So we don't have a date yet, but she has said she will be coming to Gig Harbor, um, thanks to our ambassador who bumps into her and tells her, you have to go to Gig Harbor. And so here we are when during our pickleball tour for the first time, when I had to introduce her to pickleball, we went out to Bainbridge Island. And of course, Governor Inslee had to stop by and say hello to her and thank her for coming to the state of Washington and learning about pickleball. Um, we also, you'll see Miriam over here, some of the the women of Gig Harbor, who um, we had lunch with at Tides, which she absolutely adored. And this was the first time at Canterwood learning how to play, one of the places she played. Just how relaxed she is out here in the harbor. I mean, is that a happy face or what? I mean, she just loves it, loves it, loves it. So here is the, the logo we have. And this was, um, this was made by Natalie Wimberly. And there's a Facebook page if you want to find anything more about Sister Cities. It's really a wonderful Facebook page that she has created with this logo. She gives updates about what's going on in Croatia, what's going on in Norway. It's, I can't say enough about it. Uh, Gig Harbor has a history of having a Sister City. If you want to know any more about Sister Cities, the expert is actually in this room, Mr. Mark Hoppen, right in the corner, who's on our, our commission um, in the back, is raising his hand. He was part of the initiative back in 2002. Gig Harbor had a sister city with a city in Japan. Unfortunately, that city um, has some issues and dissolved. It went into another city. So you can't have a sister city with a city that is no longer a city. And so in 2003, we no longer have uh, had a city with uh, a sister city with another city. Um, and the initiative was decided to be reinvented by the wonderful Rotarians, um, who, whose mission really aligns with what Sister City International is all about. And that's kind of where I came in, not because of Rotary, which I think is fantastic and I want to get more involved with. Um, but if, if you look at Sister City International and their mission and Rotary Foundation, what they do, you'll see a lot of overlap in what they do. And um, the Rotarians had decided they wanted to set up two sister cities, Norway and Croatia, and they had picked the city of Bulda for Norway. Now, the way that things work for sister cities is that they normally don't have more than one sister city with a city in each country. So for the United States, for Gig Harbor, Gig Harbor had to find a city in Norway that hadn't already formed a friendship tie with another U.S. city. Not so easy, right? We have our friends in Tacoma who have a sister city, and, and um, Seattle has Bergen, Anchorage has Tromsø, uh, Fairbanks has um, Muirana. So you had to find a city. They found Buda, which when I came to Gig Harbor and found this out, thanks to Kurt, who connected me with, with folks from Rotary who were working on this, I was thrilled. It happens to be where my mother is from. It happens to be where I bring a lot of people to Alaska for different initiatives, have them at my host, my house for all sorts of different events. I know these guys intimately. And so I was very happy to help with this initiative um, because I know all these people who work and do things in Buda. But first let's talk about Braj. Oops, we lost Braj before we get to that. Um, Braj is a city of about 14,000 people for Croatia. And I'm not gonna talk too much about it because I am kind of the Norway expert person, but it is super fascinating. I'm really excited um, about this as well, which is also in process. It hasn't happened yet, but um, the city of Milna is what has been 
chosen as the city to be the twin partnership city of Gig Harbor. And the the island of Brach is a village where the Sioux Martin people live, which fun fact that I have now learned is there are more Sioux Martin people in Gig Harbor than there are in Brach. So we have a, a strong connection to the folks that live there. And um, this, I, this apparently looks like paradise, especially on days that are raining here in Gig Harbor. Um, they have apparently 240 days a year of sunshine is 30 miles long, nine miles wide. It takes about an hour to drive from one end of Brach to the other end of Brach. And um, in Milna and right by Bowl, actually, you can see a little bit farther to the south. Let's see, there it is. They have um, a beautiful shape-shifting beach and it was named um, by Lonely Planet, one of the top 10 beaches in the world to visit that beach. So it's on my bucket list of places to go. Um, Milna is a great starting point. If you wanna to go to the Adriatic Sea, you can do that from the, the city of Milna. Here you can see it. And it's famously one of the favorite ports for sailors. I'm going to the middle Adriatic. It's by well, wonderful nature, trees, olive trees, pebble beaches, clear sea. And it's supposed to be one of the most safest and most beautiful harbors in the whole island. So that is the city that has been selected. Um, there are some folks who are planning on going to Croatia and um, making this happen in the fall. So still working on that relationship. I hope it happens. It'll be super exciting. And then Norway. So Norway has a long history. I understand here with Gig Harbor, I'm learning more and more about it every day. Super excited about that. While I haven't seen the data and the figures about the Norwegians here, um, I'm learning that they had farms and they were fishermen and their Crescent Valley were a lot of people, Artendale were a lot of people. I've heard of the Alvestad family. I've met one person who knows someone from the Alvestad family. And I've also heard this wonderful story about Mr. Borgen and Donker Creek Park and the Norwegian Army Knife Club. Has anybody here by chance a member of the Norwegian Army, Swiss Army Knife Club? Yes. So, so my understanding about this story, I just have to share it because this is kind of these stories that I'm learning and I just love this history. And as I look out into Gig Harbor from my house, I think about all the people who are here before me from Norway and why they love Gig Harbor so much. And I just love that. So Mr. Borgen, George Borgen, apparently was out of town. And one of his employees decided to buy 2000 Swiss army knives from China. And uh, George Borden came home and was not very happy about these Swiss army knives from China, didn't know what to do with it. So came up with the idea that he was going to create the Norwegian knife club. And he said that anybody who purchased one of these knives for, oh, what is that in the back? That is one of those knives. Are you kidding me? Okay. Oh my gosh, two knives. Okay, I, I need to take a picture with your knife. <laughs> the door did say you can't bring weapons into this establishment. I didn't violate the code, but I would like to take pictures of people with who violated this wonderful code. This is hilarious. So for $6.50, apparently you too purchased one of these 2000 Swiss Army knives, which gave you free membership for life to the Norwegian Knife Club. And every year you would meet and hold up these knives. How many times did you meet um, for the Swiss Army Knife Club? I haven't been invited. Yet, so. <laughs> well, it's no longer there, unfortunately. Okay, well, I, I hope we can take a picture afterwards because this is, this is fantastic. And there's some folks that would gather at uh, Donger Hugh Park for, for Swiss Army Knife Club. I also see it right around me. This is my neighbor. And he is the cutest little four-year-old, Håkon is his name, which is the name of the crown prince of Norway. So the next king of Norway will be named King Håkon, just like my neighbor. On the other side, I have a neighbor, his dog is named Björn, and Björn means bear in Norwegian. It's a big, fluffy, black labradoodle, looks just like a bear. And so I'm surrounded by Norway, just all around me. And so here we have Norway. And, and Norway is part of Scandinavia. People often get Norway and Scandinavia confused. Norway, Scandinavia is Norway, Sweden, Denmark. If you add Iceland and Finland, then you get the Nordics. And Norway is doing a lot to rebrand itself with the Nordics. So you'll hear more um, 
talking, getting away from Scandinavia to Nordics in this new branding, you know, recognizing that the power of the many is better than the fat power of the few. And um, now with the addition of Sweden and Finland um, going into um, helping with the war in Ukraine and all of that that's happening, um, you're, the Nordic countries are really finding this relationship and this partnership um, something that that they that they're cherishing is is bringing people together. Norway has a population about five five and a half million people, but there's actually kind of we talked about the Sumartines. There's more you know Sumartines here in Gig Harbor. There are about as many Norwegians in the United States as there are in Norway, and I've heard a figure that there's about one in ten people in Washington State who have Norwegian relatives. So I love it when people tell me about that they have grandmothers and great grandmothers and fathers that that are from Norway. A lot of us have that and have migrated here to Washington state for all sorts of reasons. Norway has the longest tunnel in Norway. They love building tunnels. Mountains don't stop them. They go over them, around them and through them. Um, North Cape is the northernmost part of Norway. You'll see Shirkenes is the most eastern part of Norway, is further east than Finland. It also is as far east as Cairo. And you'll also see on there that there's a 123 mile border that is bordering with Russia. And that is um, very key as we, we think about what's going on right now. Norway introduced salmon sushi to Japan. People try to quote me, they're like, didn't they introduce sushi to Japan? No, they didn't, but they were brilliant in their marketing and said, hey, you should put salmon in your sushi. And by doing that, they increased the market for salmon <laughs> exponentially. And, you know, shoot, we can even have California rolls down here. So um, they also have the largest sovereign wealth fund. So all of you financial people out there, the Sovereign Wealth Fund for Norway is now at $1.4 trillion. Alaska's Sovereign Wealth Fund today is about $79 billion. And the Alaska Permanent Fund um, Sovereign Wealth Fund was established in 1979, where um, Norway's was in 1990, quite a bit later with their oil. And why is Norway's so far ahead of Alaska's? That's something that Alaskans study over and over again. Norway's, Norwegians went to Alaska to figure out what Alaska did when they set theirs up and they shook their head and they said, mm, yeah, we're not going to do it that way. And um, I remember sending a delegation from Alaska to Norway boy, over a decade ago. They were scratching their head going, hey, why is Alaska's sovereign wealth fund at 50 billion when Norway's is at 500 billion? And they came back, you know, with with kind of the answers to that. Well, flash forward a little over a decade, Alaska's grown from 50 to 79 billion, and Norway's grown from 50 to 1.4 trillion dollars. What that means for Norway is that they earn more off their sovereign wealth fund than they do off of oil and gas. So, so the revenues that they're receiving off of that now surpasses everything. It's something that they see for future generations, and they take that very seriously. That's part of their ethos and um, something that we're seeing a lot now as oil prices are high, they're producing a lot of oil to help with um, Russian, not producing so much for um, Europe, and um, they're saving it, they're not spending it. They don't have any national debt, they have national universal health care. their name, um, national number one for better life index, and one of the lowest crime rates in the world. So why are so many Norwegians living in the United States? Hmm. Well, it's a pretty great place to be here. I'm here, right? <laughs> we love it. Okay. So foreign policy um, talks about Norway. And if you've any of you've traveled to Norway, I you know, love sharing our Norway pictures, right? It doesn't do them justice. It is so hard to capture a fjord or a mountain or the cobblestones. This is where my oldest son went to school. It looks like Hogwarts. I mean, really? That's a school? It's really cool. This is actually during World War II where they hid the King of Norway for a period um, as the resistance fighters um, were, were trying to keep him safe before they sent him to the United States, actually. Um, and so, so why are Norwegians so happy? Um, most, Nor most people consider Norwegians to be socialists. They do not consider themselves to be socialists. So um, the Norwegian ambassador can, talks about Norwegian, Norway as being capitalist with a heart. They are definitely a capitalist society, 
but they do have a welfare state. So kind of a mixed state of capitalism, welfare state, and social democracy. That's really the best way to, to talk about Norway. They combine this free market, but the government does own some of the key financial institutions. So that, but there definitely is capitalism as a driver. And they're so happy because their financial stressors have been taken away. The government takes care of you for retirement. All of your health care is taken care of. All of your, your senior living, everything is taken care of. All of your education for your students are taken care of. Um, any of these things that, that really seem to, to harm Americans um, when, it, when it hits you on and for big costs, they take care of that. For that, there's a big tax, 40 to 55% in your income tax. You have 25% VAT tax. If you buy a car, it's 100% tax on your cars. So you, know, you pay for that, but they also take care for you of you for these financial stressors. Normally when I talk, and I think I talked a lot about this last time I was here and talking about business in Norway, I talk about sustainable economic development. It's really something that Norway believes in. They're, they put a lot of money and energy. How do you balance sustainable development with the environment? And um, I'm not gonna talk about that today. Why? Because we have had a little bit of a disruptor going on. And these are the four things that I'm going to just kind of spend the rest of my time talking about, um, because this is, this is really, this really changed things, but they're all interrelated. So interesting enough, these four things are inter interrelated. So the, well, let's start with the war in Ukraine. So the war in Ukraine started, what, February a year ago? So we're about a year and a half into that. And Norway stands together strongly with the US for the war in Ukraine. And now they also stand strongly with the Nordics and they, they make that clear. Um, and they say it's very important that Putin does not win this war for the Scandinavian, for the Nordics and for the world. And they, they also don't want uh, China to fall into a similar path. Before this happened, Norway was saying the United States was a little bit overblown in its analysis of China, uh, not anymore. They are now full on board with now the United States analysis of China and um, this war and things that have happened recently have changed their perspective on that. They're currently supplying all sorts of things to the Ukraine. You know, that includes tanks, defense missiles, a lot of ammunition, but also humanitarian support, governmental aid. And they stepped up and approved 22 billion US dollars over the next five years to give to the government. And then last month, they just announced $30 million to fund war risk insurance and a guarantee sectors for the private sector. So they're trying to encourage the private sector to help with the rebuilding of Ukraine. And so they're gonna do that by paying for $30 million to fund this war risk insurance and to help them with political risks for sabotage, things that might happen to people as they're coming in to try to barge things, build things, um, and rebuild Ukraine. They've also uh, announced an extension of their agreement with SAS. You might, anybody here flown SAS before? Used to be owned by Norway, Sweden, Denmark. Norway got out of it about in 2018. Now it is mostly private. Denmark and Sweden still own a little bit of SAS, but Norway is funding the airlifting of people, about 1,500 people so far from the Ukraine to Norway and around Europe for medical purposes. They take their pets as well. We talked about pets and you see that in what's happening in Maui. Um, and so they are funding that uh, through 2024. And so with the, the increase in money that they've received from oil prices, they haven't increased their spending on themselves. They're trying to increase their spending on efforts like the Ukraine war and other sort of schemes. The consequence of the war is that uh, Russia was the main supplier of gas to Europe. And Norway saw, the world saw that as, a, as an issue. So before that happened, the biggest political um, issue when the elections came around was the issue of should Norway be exploring for any more oil and gas or should they just stop? Has anyone seen the movie Occupied? <laughs> It is scaringly a real story. It's not, it's totally fiction. But that is the kind of discussion that they have been having now for a few years, but it really ramped up highly before 
the the war in Ukraine start? And, that, and this, the the question is, if Norway doesn't believe that burning of fossil fuels is good for the environment, which they don't, their power is all um, sustainable. It used to be all hydroelectric. Now there's a little bit of wind and solar. But if they don't believe fossil fuel burning is good for Norway or the environment, why are they why are they producing it and giving it to the world to burn? We all live in one global economy. So in Occupy, they shut it down and Russia says, no, you can't do that. Anyways, I'm not going to spoil the movie. You should see it. It's fiction. It's really good. So that was the, that was this that was the biggest issue for politics was should we be exploring or should we not? Not an issue anymore. Right now, Norway's are united, Norwegians are pretty much united that yes, they should continue exploring because they want to be able to supply Europe during this transition. They don't want Russia to have an over influence on Europe. Um, and so they wanna keep that supply going. They don't wanna keep the money themselves. They wanna help the world with that. But they also want to do something to transition energy such that the world is not dependent on oil and gas from Norway. And so the, we'll get to that of what they're doing. 95% um, of the gas that they sell, they travel by pipeline. 5% is LNG. And another great consequence of the war is addition of Finland and Sweden to NATO. I alluded to that a little bit earlier. As we know, NATO has ratified um, Finland. That's a done deal. Sweden has been um, agreed upon. It should be ratified, um, I think, in September. That's coming up. Norway had a lot of behind-the-scenes work to help make that happen. That was, that, that was unthinkable before this happened. There, there, there was nobody who thought that would ever happen that Sweden especially would join um, NATO. And so this, this, is, this is really important for security and trade up in the Arctic. Um, they are Scandinavian countries. They, their country that, oh, let me see. Let's actually just, let's just go to that. Security and trade. So the war has drastically changed security and trade policy for Norway. And Norway has always said that they are the eyes and the ears of the North. They are aligned um, with the United States. They, um, they have the Atlantic coast off Norway and their most important ally is the United States. So if Norway were to need help from the United States at any time, the US would come across the Atlantic. You've probably seen the Atlantic crossing, also another great movie going the other way, but the US would come across there, the Atlantic. And so controlling that coastline, um, for Norway is very important to help the United States if anything that happens. And that's a big task for Norway. Um, they keep their eyes on Russia. Russia has a very large nuclear base close to the border of Norway. And um, they also have a lot of submarines. They're doing a lot of activity around the border. So they're keeping an eye on that. But Sweden and Finland also have a lot of similar capabilities. Sweden has a very strong army. And both Sweden and Finland have a very strong air force. Uh, Finland recently, before all this, purchased about 64 um, F-35s. So they have been doing a lot of training with the U.S. military with the F-35s, same with Norway, same with Sweden. And so Sweden and Finland, they have their focus more on the Baltic Sea. So with the Northern Sea Raw, the Barents Sea of Norway, the Baltic Sea, there's a lot of coverage now that NATO has because of this new um, change as a result of the war in Ukraine. Um, another thing that has changed, as I mentioned with uh, China, when we talk about security, is their view on um, TikTok. And so TikTok is something that uh, Norway first originally said was fine. Now anyone in the Norwegian government can't have it on their phone. Um, my son uses it to promote his music. It's still something that the people of Norway are using, but the government is saying no. They're looking at Twitter. They're keeping an eye, eye on it. They're not really sure about it but that's, that is also changing. They do not have, interestingly enough, a free trade agreement with the United States, which is really interesting, despite all of the partnerships that belong with NATO and um, the past history that they've had for all these years, they don't have a free trade agreement. And that is something of um, importance for Norway right now because of things, when we talk about the next one, which is the green transition, the Biden administration just announced the IRA, um, which is the Inflation Reduction Act for this green transition, but it has a lot of Buy America rhetoric and requirements in 
that um, act. So for example, if you wanted to buy an electric vehicle, um, it has to be made in America, the battery has to be made in America, the minerals have to be coming from America or countries that have a free trade agreement. Norway doesn't have that. They have a lot of minerals. They want to be part of that. They believe in it. They want to be partners with the United States. And so they're not able to um, be part of this. And so that is something that Norway is, is trying to do, um, is to, to really you know, show their alignment for these initiatives, like this, the green transition, and, and, and get some type of free trade agreement going. So you might have seen um, this <laughs> During, during the Super Bowl, Will Ferrell, he picked a fight with Norway. It is actually hilarious. I don't know if you realize his wife is Swedish. And at the very end, his wife makes a cameo. And he's supposed to be ending up in Norway, but he actually ends up in Sweden. And he's like going, gosh, darn it. How are they ahead of us in electric vehicles? Um, it really is amazing that Norway has come this far in in electric vehicles. And Will Ferrell has a beef with that. You know, I never thought it would be possible. I first heard about it in 2015, Norway announced, they said by 2025, all of their electric vehicles sold, were good, or all their vehicles sold were gonna be electric. I was like, no way, they love, their, they love their gas, they love their cars, it's not gonna happen. Well, here we are, almost all their cars now sold for 2023 are electric vehicles. I mean, almost all of them, electric or hybrid. I wanna say it's like 90%. And if you rent a car there, most likely it's going to be electric. And they did that by incentives and just making it too convenient, too easy, too much of a math problem that you like, am I crazy not to buy an electric vehicle? So, so people are. And, um, that, that's happening all over. They sell more Teslas per capita in Norway than anywhere else in the world. And why is that? Because it's cheaper than buying a Toyota Corolla. Go figure. It's all because of taxes. The ferries are electric. Um, you can't enter some of the fjords anymore unless you're on an electric ferry. So they make these type of policies to make it so that you have to change. They're also working to have 100% of their domestic flights on airplanes electric by 24 with the first commuter plane in the air by 2026. And so um, they have this history of producing green energy and then using it, and that's what they want to do. So now with the, with the green transition, they, um, they've taken their offshore wind technology that they use for oil and gas, gas production. I don't know if you realize that Norway's oil and gas is all produced offshore, unlike Alaska, which is all produced onshore. Alaska says it's too much of a risk for the environment to do it offshore. Norway says eh, it's too much of a risk for the environment to do it onshore. We're going to do it all offshore. Interesting. Um, but they have then created this, this understanding of how to float big structures um, on water that's precarious. So they've taken that, trans that, that competence and they moved it over to giant wind turbines. And so they now are building gigantic turbines, Equinor. They now have an with California. They're coming into Oregon. Um, I think they have their eye on Washington State um, for these massive offshore wind turbines that Norway has learned how to float. And they're going to be producing 25 gigawatts of power. Now, to put that in perspective, that's about what California is working to produce. It's also twice the amount of power that Norway needs. And Norway doesn't need any power. Norway already has all the power that it needs from hydroelectric power. Um, so all this is going to be for export. And that's what I was alluding to when I was talking about how are they thinking about transitioning away from oil and gas for the world. And they want to do that through floating offshore wind turbines. They're also looking at, of course, hydrogen, ammonia in the future, which is important. So a vibrant Arctic. Um, this has been the number one foreign policy priority for Norway for a long time. And with all this, uh, Russia and the Ukraine, this is all part of this as well. Um, the, the Arctic, as we know, uh, we are part of the Arctic Council, of the United States, because of Alaska, we have a seat on the Arctic Council. It's a very important governing body, body with eight countries that are part of the Arctic Councils, and it promotes stability and peace. It got disrupted by the war. Each country takes a turn being the chair of the Arctic country. It just so happened that Russia had the chairmanship of the Arctic Council during the time of the war. So everything came to a stop. And that's a problem when we talk about 
How do you manage fish stocks shared with different countries? How do you do um, science and technology? How do we talk about indigenous peoples and rights? Um, so that all came to a stop. Now in 2023, the chairmanship of the Arctic Council is in the hands of Norway. And Norway really wants to bring Russia into the conversation, recognizing that you can't have a conversation about the Arctic without all the Arctic partners. So Russia needs to be part of the conversation, but they can't, of course, as long as this is going on, they can't. So they are trying to figure out how to do that um, as soon as they can. They're also a leader when it comes to clean oceans. It's very important for the Arctic and the world. And um, they have a, a really interesting uh, site about uh, clean oceans, the ocean panel, if you ever Google that, it's really super interesting. Here's a couple more uh, uh, slides of, of what the Arctic looks like. It's probably not what you think, especially if you've been to Alaska. I, I have someone here in the back who's been to, to Barrow as Nome. Um, if you go above the Arctic Circle in Nor in Alaska, it's ice, 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 ice and snow. I mean, it's really, it's, it's frozen. Um, if you go by the Arctic Circle in Norway, including our sister city, Bulda, it looks like this. It, it doesn't freeze. The water is, is ice-free all year round because of the Gulf Stream that hits it. And um, it's got roads and infrastructure. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a vibrant place to be. It's, it's an exciting place. Our sister city, is um, Boulder, as we mentioned, they were named the city of culture for 2024. So that means a lot is gonna be happening in Boulder. I took a delegation from Gig Harbor in Alaska to our sister city last year in our part of the efforts to establish the sister city relationship. Hope to take some people again next year um, as part of this. There's gonna be some different type of conferences. We went to the High North Dialogue in Boulder they're gonna be combining three of them. If anybody's interested in going to our sister city, this is gonna be an exciting year. There's gonna be a lot happening for the city of culture um, happening there. And if you want more information on Norway, here are some of my favorites. Of course, the Gig Harbor Sister City Facebook page. Natalie did an amazing job with that. Visit Norway. If you wanna travel, if you, I know a lot of you said you've traveled to Norway, love this site. It'll tell you if you're a foodie or if you like to bicycle or if you, you know, whatever you like to do for your travel, it'll package it for you and tell you how to do that. Um, Government.no no has a, a click, you can do it in English and you can read directly from the government what their initiatives, what they're doing. Uh, the Norwegian ambassador has a Twitter feed. That's how she gets her information out. Netflix, there's some of my favorites. And then books, they are really into dark crime. And so uh, UNESCO is, is one of my favorites. And The Snowman, of course, have to, being from Alaska, you have to read The Snowman. So if you have any questions, here's my contact information. And I'm happy to answer questions if we have more time, Kurt. Now leave that screen up so we can take photos with our Facebook page so we can look into those locations. Hey, is there a separate microphone for the Q&A? Yeah. Oh, all right. So Q&A time. Hey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Welcome. By the way, do they uh, speak English in Norway? They do. So <laughs> they are required to learn English starting at age seven. So all through school, it's they, they're learning English. Their university undergrads in Norwegian. Um, some of their textbooks are in Norwegian. Graduate school is all in English. So they speak English as well as we do. It's they, they recognize that only five and a half million people speak Norwegian. If they want to go anywhere, if they want to go to Europe, if they want to go to France, if they want to Germany, Italy, they have to speak English. So they put a lot of focus. They don't dub anything there. Everything is you know, spoken in English on their TV. They have subtitles. So they hear it, they hear the music, and they really embrace it. They love Americans. Q&A, here. Peter. With regard to the uh, health healthcare program, uh, how are physicians paid and how do they recruit physicians? I, you know, I don't know how they recruit physicians, that, that I'm not sure, but they're paid, they're not paid exorbitantly like they are here. It's, um, it's a profession like other professions. It's not something that has a high premium on it's also a system where you don't get to pick your physician. So it's not like you can, um, you can get more patients based on your work, if you, if you will. 
you go to the physician that is close by to you or the one that your referring doctor refers you to. You don't have a choice. I would like to know how strong is the Norwegian Club in Tacoma? That's quite a huge building there on, um, I believe it's 19. I haven't been to the Norwegian Club in Tacoma. There's also the Sons of, there's the Sons of Norway Lodge there. Is that the one you're thinking of in downtown? Yes. This, this one's Norway. It, it used to be really large, according to my mother. So my mother used to be the president of Sons of Norway for international for the whole United States. And so she used to come down to Tacoma a lot and go there. But um, I haven't been there yet. So Don't they have a chapter in Bowlesville as well. They do. They do. They have one in Paulsbo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Bremerton. Active, and, yeah. and Bremerton used to be really active as well. Right. But and then in Ballard, there's a lot of Norwegians in Ballard, right? The fishing community. There are. There are. And the 17th of May, May Parade, they have their largest one outside of Norway. You know, I'm Classic. thinking, uh, not this September, but next September, you need to lead a tour of gig carburites to Croatia and Buda, Norway. What do you think? That's a great idea. Yeah. That's a great idea. All right. Q&A. Mark? There's a tour being planned to go to Milna in Croatia now, the brought in October. John, you want to go? <laughs> <clears throat> you got a Q&A? Yep. I'm a sweet very to a fan. But I really enjoyed the Norway events. Fjords. At least I talk a little bit about the ferries that run up and down the coast. Isn't that a good way to travel? And how, what are the options? How do you do that? Yeah, so that's called Hurtiruten, which is really hard to say. Sorry. It means it means quick route. It's not quick. <laughs> I don't know why it has that word. I actually saw that they have a building in Seattle down by uh, Lake Union. I'm not sure what that is, but it's a postal uh, ferry that goes all up the coast. And so it's really a cool way to see the coast of Norway. It's not cheap. You would think it would be cheap. It's not. Um, they have to leave so many spots for people to jump on and jump off, but you can start. Um, I mean, I've started in Bergen. You can go all the way up to the top, up to Schirkness and back, and you can stop anywhere in between. And um, it's, it's kind of like a cruise ship. I mean, it's wonderful food and it's good accommodations. It goes slow. You can also hop off when you come to these communities. You have time to run around a little bit and then get back on. It, it's a fantastic way to see Norway. And that one photo you had up there, the two people diving into the bay, I think the bay was in Boda or in the waterway, Boda. Um, what, what's the water temperature? Is it comparable to Puget Sound temperature? It will depends what time of year it is. You know, Puget Sound seems cold to me. It seems cold all year round. I'm not sure what that is. There's no Gulf Stream that hits here or something. It's cold. Norway gets warm in the summer, the water, and it's a little bit cold in the winter, but you can still do it. And the latest thing are floating saunas. So in Boda, in Oslo, everywhere you go, you see these floating saunas. So the biggest trend right now in Finland was, you know, the sauna king. Um, Norwegians like it as well for cell rejuvenation. It's supposed to keep you young. It's supposed to do all sorts of great things to your body to have the shock from the hot to the cold. And so you go out into these floating saunas, some are on shore and some are out in the water that they take you out or you swim out to, and you get really, really, and then you dive right in and you can do it all year round. And um, we were there with our group for the sister cities. And I think it was March. It's pretty, it was pretty cold. We had one guy every single morning. He was up and he was in the sauna and he was jumping in the water. So yeah, up above the Arctic Circle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so it's a lot colder than the Kailua Bay you know, for the Ironman competition. Isn't it? It's a lot. Yeah, you don't, you don't you do it. In... To that water for the Ironman in the morning, the water temperature is warmer than the outside temperature. <laughs> It's like, it's like swimming in an aquarium. Oh my gosh. I don't know how people are supposed to go forward because it's like Nemo is everywhere. There's all of these fish and just amazing things everywhere you look. It's, it's paradise. By the way, that photo you showed of the Norwegian army knife in front of the Borgen, uh, you know, um, lumber store and stuff up there, Donkey Creek. The, um, what's left, you know, what's Donkey Creek now is the restrooms and the walls were made out of the vertical logs from the Borgen lumber building. And so is my house. 
Yes. Oh, you got one of those. Oh, yeah. And Charles Austin, who had the sawmill down where the museum is now, he pioneered the vertical log homes. And there's just like four left in Gig Harbor. And you got one of them. All right. I love it. All right. Q&A. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you so much. Lisa, You're welcome. Good. Go to the order. Is anybody online? Okay. Hey, Mark, tell us about the uh, ribbon cutting for the Thunderbird number one. Yeah. In the late 50s, my dad and a guy named Ben Seaborn uh, co designed uh, a small 26 foot sailboat called the Thunderbird. And it was Seaborn's design in my dad's construction layout. And there are thousands upon thousands of them now. But the first one was conserved by my brother from up in Port Townsend, where, where it was before it came back to the harbor. And when my brother got it, like a couple of those who couldn't take care of it very well. So he decided he better donate it to the museum before it fell apart. And so he did. And now it's uh, been put back into use and it's going to be launched on the 26th. Thursday. And they're good, and I, I'm going to get to sail it. And if you come down there, I'll tell you a little bit about the history of it beyond this. But I'll tell you this: it was the first family sailboat that was cheap enough that a human being could buy it and build it if they wanted to. And my dad built about the first twenty some of them, and uh, it's the boat that I learned to sail on. And so the, our first family boat was Thunderbird Number Two, but it was longer. Because number three paid, and so he got launched second. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, it's still my favorite boat. And I actually, a boat that followed the Thunderbird, the 40 foot boat that was the first big boat that had a flattened aft to plane and was arguably the first big boat in the world. The Osa? The Osa, yeah, which I still own and have taken care of since 1963. And I'm going down to sand it again and varnish it again this morning. Mm. Thanks so much, Mark. And then the one that's parked at the park dock uh, at the end of the dock, is that number two, is that the number two that down there? Yes, that's our old family boat. Yeah. It, it was, uh, our family boat was totally yeah. for a long time. It was taken care of after we sold it in 1960. And uh, the family's treasured it. But ultimately, it went nowhere. And uh, the last, I saw it several years before the Gig Harbor Boat Shop bought it. Up at the wooden boat uh, operation at the south end of the community where I was living in Hawk on Thunderbirds. And it was rotten and it was down the side. It looked like it wasn't even flammable. And Jamie Storkman, uh, his wife Joan Fuller, who was involved in uh, teaching kids to sail programs, you have to have. Uh, Jamie Storkman bought, got the boat shop to buy it back and for a year and a half. Jamie Storkman and other guy restored it. It's almost better now. It wasn't perfect. <laughs> and if you ever walk through Arabella's Landing uh, Marina out behind behind bricks and next to the Mission Number Nine, you can see two of the Thunderbirds that are moored right there in that marina, and they frequently are out there Thursday nights racing back and forth. It's really cool. Any, anything else for the good of the order today? So, what's happening with the parks? Uh, August twenty fourth, Thursday, Thursday, August twenty fourth at four thirty p.m. We will be having the groundbreaking ceremony for the new community recreation center, 58,000 square foot indoor recreation facility with an indoor soccer field, three multi-purpose wood courts, some meeting rooms, and Christmas trails will be coming through that property on the side closest to the Highway 16, connecting to the 24th Street overpass. So join us for that ribbon cutting. There'll be all kinds of great community leaders there as well. Also, movies in the park is going on at Zama Homestead Park every Friday evening. The, the event starts at about 7.30. The movie starts about 8 p.m. These are, are movies for families, so bring the kids. Um, also, uh, this Wednesday, well, August 16th, next Wednesday, from 6 to 8 p.m., we have another concert. The National Park Radio is the band. And for, for both of these events, the movies in the park and the concert, bring food for the Fish Food Bank. Kiwanis Club will be gathering them and delivering to the Fish Food Bank. Other than that, everything else is having a great week, everybody. John? The canoe and paddle club, which was done in Florida oh. uh, this week, came back again to Gig Harbor with the number one national 
trophy for the whole city of the harbor to enjoy. But anyway, they came back on Tuesday night and they had it just a pretty boring time. It was 21 years old and it's their 10th national championship. And uh, several of their paddlers are going to be going to the world championships here uh, because they qualified by winning the national championship. And then they anticipate that next year in the Olympics, a couple of those kids will probably be there. Thank you. Hey, Matt, thanks so much for setting up today. I really appreciate it. Everybody, thank you for coming. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. You ready to go? Uh, the, you ready to go on the mail boat? Mail boat ferry in uh, Norway. Sounds kind of interesting. It does. Very hard.